The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. Looking back, many people think of the years of John F. Kennedy's presidency as Camelot, but alongside the joys of having a young, attractive family in the White House, this period was marked by an intense confrontation with the Soviets. Joining us in the first half of a two-part discussion is Ted Sorensen, special counsel and speechwriter for President Kennedy. For over 40 years, he has chronicled our evolving understanding of the Kennedy family, its achievements, and its weaknesses. And now, Doug Besheroff. Ted Sorensen, welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> we are honored to have you here as a guest, um, uh, not just because of your service to President Kennedy uh, and to the nation, but for your commitment to the welfare of the nation. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk about many things, but I just want to mention that so much of what I've relearned about uh, John F. Kennedy comes from your marvelous new book, Counselor. So thank you for writing this, and we'll talk a little bit later about how you came about to write it. But it's a wonderful book. I recommend it highly to every, everyone in the audience, uh, on TV as well as here in the room. Thanks. Well, you've joked that your obituary is going to say, Theodore C. Sorensen, Kennedy's speechwriter. Well, I've also joked it's going to say, Theodore C. Sorensen, age 103, shot by a jealous husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't planning on asking you about that. <laughs> and later on, I do want to ask you about speechwriting. But first... I'd like to explore what was your special relationship with a very special man, but also one that's really quite difficult to understand from the outside. And I want to get this right, um, so I want to read what Arthur Schlesinger said about um, the two of you. Um, and this is in A Thousand Days. He said, both men, you and President Kennedy, shared so much, the same quick tempo, detached intelligence, deflationary wit, realistic judgment, candor in speech, coolness in crisis, that when it came to policy and speeches, they operated nearly as one. For a history professor, Arthur could really write. <laughs> <laughs> and yet the two of you were very different. Different backgrounds, different educations. That's true on the surface. He came from a uh, millionaire's family. I came from a middle-class family. He was from the Northeast. I was from the Midwest. He was a Roman Catholic. I was a Unitarian. He had been a war hero. I did not turn 18 until after World War II was over. And yet, on what really mattered, our commitment to making this a better country and a better world, our interest in public policy, public affairs, on matters like that, we, were, we really did see eye to eye. We both had a sense of humor, and uh, we both uh, appreciated uh, good uh, public servants and uh, good deeds. But I'd like to get you to talk a little bit more about how much your thinking and words were in sync. I came across a story, I don't know if it's true, that during one of the campaign stops in the 1960 oh, campaign... Oh, yes, I know this one. Well, tell the story, because I don't <laughs> want to get it wrong. Well, uh, assuming we're talking about the same story, uh, I think it was either in Ohio or West Virginia during the period that we no doubt will talk about, because the, I stress it in the book, between the 56 convention and the 60 convention, JFK and I traveled to all 50 states together, just the two of us. And at one of these stops, fairly early, 
I'm uh, sorry, fairly late, by which time we were picking up a few press people uh, taking some interest. JFK had laryngitis in the worst kind. He, he could barely whisper. And so uh, he whispered, he got up and whispered to the crowd that I was going to read his speech for him, and he apologized. And I got up and I read the speech for him, if I say so, with emphasizing the right places and <laughs> pausing in the right places, left it on the rostrum, and we left. And Al Otten, who was then a Wall Street Journal Washington correspondent, a wonderful man who's uh, not so well, I hear, but still with us. Al uh, went up on the stage and took a look at the text. It was blank paper. <laughs> now, when I read that story, I was struck by two things. One, the obvious, what you were able to pull off. But the second was that Jack Kennedy was working without a script as well. Not true. Go ahead. <laughs> no, of course, uh, uh, we knew that he had laryngitis, and uh, that but then by the time he recovered his voice at our next stop, or the, maybe the next day, uh, he would read from a uh, text. There were occasions during <clears throat> the post-convention campaign when he would make several speeches a day. Mm -hmm when he would speak from a single sheet of paper, which was enough to get him going, remind him of the major points he wanted to make. He did not to follow every word that was on that particular text. The press uh, complained to Pierre Salinger, the press secretary, and I had a joke that Kennedy was a known text deviant. <laughs> But he felt more comfortable having at least a piece of paper in his hand, lest under the pressure of speaking so many times a day, he get up there and forget what he was going to talk about. But I am struck in comparison to today and the very heavily scripted politicians we see so often. And I don't want to say that in a negative way, but I read in, in Counselor about the preparation for the debates, and I want to talk about that. Ah, that's, a debate is quite different. Uh, but uh, in terms of a formal speech, particularly a formal occasion, such as television or to a large dinner or the United Nations or something of that sort, yes, he certainly had a text and... Uh, oh, sure. And, ...and read the text. But if he... Uh, needed to speak from the back of a truck or a train uh, off the cuff. He was capable of being very articulate and eloquent without any help from me. Could you tell us a little bit about the preparation for the debates? Uh, in your book, you talk about sitting on the roof That's in right. Chicago Hotel. That's right. With JFK getting a suntan, which sounds like a good approach to TV as opposed to makeup. That, that was uh, his idea, yes. Uh, yes, uh, I brought with me uh, a man uh, whom I still miss. Uh, he died just a year and a half ago. He lived not far from here in Potomac. He was my deputy first in the Senate and in the Senate office and then in the White House, a man named Mike Feldman. And he was in charge of research. Oh, I hope there's somebody here who knows Mike. Isn't that nice? Wonderful man. And so he, uh, by prearrangement, met JFK and me in Chicago. The three of us sat up on the roof, JFK getting a tan instead of makeup. Mike had with him a card file, and on each card was a separate issue or question. Every possible issue and question that might come up in that debate. And he had on at least notes uh, on each card as to what was the Democratic platform position on that issue, the Republican platform position on that issue, JFK's previous statements or voting record on that issue, any statements by Nixon, his opponent, on that issue, and so on. And this was very much the same pattern that we would later employ in the White House to prepare for press conferences. 
which we did uh, at a breakfast uh, the morning of the press conference. I would fire a question or a topic, usually in question form, at JFK. If he knew all he needed to know about it, he would say, okay, and... You mean you didn't, didn't give him the answer? No, uh, if, he, if he already knew the answer, but if he said, well, remind me what was the platform position of that or something of that sort, Mike had it right there or would hand it to him. And so we went, uh, I, think the, uh, I think the book says that we went through uh, just about all the cards. He then needed a nap to make sure he was in good shape for the debate, the first televised presidential candidate debate in history. And uh, he went into his room. A couple of other members of our group uh, gathered. We waited. After a while, we started looking at our watches and no sign of the candidate. We had to be at the TV studio at a certain time. Nobody wanted to wake up the possible president, so they said I had to do that. <laughs> and I knocked, heard nothing. I walked in, and there he was, sound asleep, lying on his back, covered with cards. <laughs> now, I listened to the Kennedy-Nixon debates. NPR, National Public Radio, puts them on. And I oh, was recently. Yes, was. yes, yes. They're dated. But they're, <laughs> they're erudite. They are complete discussions, complete sentences, dare I say, on both sides. They do feel as if they are from a time past when yes, politicians yes. were. Both of them were very well informed. And, and substantive. Yes. Compared to some of the presidential debates we had to sit through this year. Yeah. In both parties. Well, yes. And it almost seems as if these days it's not the substance of the answer, but if you succeed in a zinger that seems to qualify you for higher office. Do you get that sense? Often. Often, yeah. There were many wonderful speeches that Jack Kennedy uh, delivered, uh, but I think the one that people most remember, because it was the first major speech, was the inaugural speech. You and you forgot his acceptance speech. Well, I heard an interesting story about that. Heard, I didn't read. And then in between was one of his most important speeches, and that was his speech to the, ah, the Houston, Houston Minister's Conference. Now that you've succeeded in getting me off the inaugural speech, <laughs> um, I did um, read someplace that Nixon watched the acceptance speech, which apparently was a little hurried, and decided he could debate that man. Have you heard that story? And that was one of the reasons he accepted on the debates. I hope it's true, <laughs> because it wasn't the first and only time that Nixon or others in both parties and even in other countries, underestimated John F. Kennedy. But for the inaugural speech, uh, address, excuse me, it's, this is one of those places where... The speech is an address. <laughs> where there's all this discussion about, well, who wrote what and so forth. But I was struck in your description about um, how many people had a hand in shaping the content of that speech. Could you talk a little bit about shaping the content of such an important speech? I believe that JFK suggested, along with a couple of other suggestions, one of which was worthless, uh, which was that I read all the previous 20th century inaugural addresses. What a waste of time that was, ex <laughs> except for Roosevelt's first. That was the only good one up to that time. And he also suggested that I reread or study, analyze Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to see if I could see what was the secret in that. I was quite familiar with it, but I did analyze it. And I found, among other things, it was only 10 sentences long. <laughs> but he also suggested that um, I send out letters to several people, intellectuals, gifted, eloquent friends of ours, soliciting uh, suggestions. And from 
that solicitation, I remember at least two that uh, uh, I had some hand in putting everything together, uh, though JFK made the final choices and decision, but at least two were worthwhile. And then a third suggestion came even later in the day. Of the two that were worthwhile, one is a very good one from the, uh, from Ken Galbraith, a great economics professor at Harvard, who suggested, uh, I believe it was his suggestion, the line, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Very good line and very Kennedy-esque. I believe it was Adlai Stevenson who suggested the line, boy, has this been forgotten by the country today, Civility is not a sign of weakness. And then, after the speech had been finished by JFK and I working at his home in Florida, we flew up to Washington. He asked me to show it to Walter Lippmann, who was the dean of uh, the serious uh, columnists uh, at the time. I went over to see Mr. Lippmann, handed it to him. He read it through, and he made one very good suggestion. Bear in mind, this was the height of the Cold War. And uh, a reference in the speech to our enemies or enemy, Lippmann came up with what I still think is a wonderful uh, rewording. He re instead referred to those folks as those who would make themselves our adversary. Now, whether there were others who had uh, lines in, I simply don't remember, unless there's some that I mentioned in the book. No, no, I, what I'm struck by is um, how collegial a process it was and yes. how it was a, um, an, almost an act of state. Well, first of all, when you say collegial, we didn't sit down in a big group and write it. Uh, neither Kennedy nor I believed in uh, speech writing by committee and I warn everybody else against trying that. So we uh, worked on that the same way we had worked on speeches for uh, all the years of his uh, Senate uh, service, the same way we had worked on his book, Profiles in Courage. It was a collegial, collaborative uh, process in which we each had a role. I like to think that mine was important, but uh, in terms of who is the author of that speech, it's the same as the, who is the author of Profiles and Courage or any other writing or speech. It isn't the wordsmith who's the author. It's the person who comes up with the ideas that are expressed, the decisions that are disclosed, the values that are communicated. That's the author, and John F. Kennedy was the author of the inaugural. As you mentioned, the Kennedy team you, the new president, had just gone through at least four years of campaigning from 1956 on. You just mentioned in all 50 states. Quite a process, quite close election, quite, close, say, quite close getting the nomination. You were just Wyoming, if I remember. That's exactly right. The role is called alphabetically. You needed a majority, and we reached that majority in Wyoming. Oh, we had Puerto Rico coming. <laughs> and you all were worried that if you didn't make it on the first ballot. That is correct. Him. John F. Kennedy was not a member of the Democratic Party establishment. There were many leaders of the party who did not want him to be the nominee because they were certain that his religion would defeat him just as the party had suffered a calamitous defeat when Al Smith, the governor of New York and a Roman Catholic, was nominated in 1928. And they also thought he was too young. They thought he was too inexperienced. Imagine that, saying a United States Senator is inexperienced. <laughs> and uh, so had, the, had in between the first ballot and the second ballot, the decision gone to a smoke-filled back room we had no certainty that some of the 
states we had would stay with us on the second ballot, even though they were pledged to us on the first ballot. And we thought that Lyndon Johnson, who was a uh, master of manipulation, uh, would probably find a way uh, to get some of the party bosses, particularly in the big cities, to uh, forget Kennedy and come his way. Now, I have the uh, <clears throat> disadvantage, uh, Doug, of not remembering everything that's in my own book. <laughs> And I, I'm going to, the following might not be in it, but it might be in my first book, Kennedy. And that is, Kennedy told me while we were there at the convention, he said, uh, Jake Arvey, the titular head of the Chicago party, and I should say that it's Illinois Democratic Party, says he's for me because David Lawrence, the governor of Pennsylvania, is for me. David Lawrence says he's for me because Jake Arvey's for me. We got to get this nomination and get out of town before they each discover the other one's not for it. <laughs> I should have put that in the book. Yes. Well, I do. I, before we close, I do want to talk about um, religion in the public square. And you mentioned the speech in Texas. How did that come about, and and what was Kennedy trying to do? I urge researchers on this particular issue, which is still an important issue today, very, separation very. of church and state, to take a look at Kennedy's speech in April of that year to the American Society of Newspaper Editors or Publishers, I'm not sure which, but that was his first all-out speech on that subject because we were in the middle of the West Virginia primary where it looked like religion was going to defeat him. But it's a pretty good speech on that issue. After he had the nomination and in his con acceptance speech at the convention, he gave some reassurance to the greater American public tuning in that religion was not a value that he would place ahead of his oath to the Constitution and his obligations to the national interest. Then early in the campaign, I remember fairly well, we were on a, uh, I think it was probably mid-September, and in those days, the official campaign didn't begin until Labor Day. And uh, we get word that the Houston Protestant ministers, I think probably it was a conference they had every year, uh, were inviting both Nixon and Kennedy to address them on the subject of the religious issue. Nixon was too smart to be trapped into that. He had said very sincerely, I'm not going to raise the religious issue in this campaign. He was so sincere about it, he said it in every state. <laughs> uh, anyway, he uh, declined this invitation, and Bobby uh, flew out, Bobby Kennedy was the campaign manager, and he flew out, got on the train, and discussed what should be done about it. And the, the, it was clear by then that no matter what JFK had said, no matter how clear he had tried to make his message in the acceptance speech, his earlier message to the newspaper editors, the issue wouldn't die. There was too strong a feeling in this country that a Catholic president would somehow be subject to the orders of the Pope or the Catholic hierarchy in this country, and everybody was full of uh, juicy stories about what went on in convents, and <laughs> what for some priest had ordered this or declared that, and uh, it, was, it was just an impossible fight, and so JFK said, I'm gonna accept that invitation and I'm going to uh, you know, just go on the, all out on this issue. Uh, I had been in charge of that issue, so to speak, for years and years. And um, I was working on the speech. I, I, I do tell in the book that uh, Mike Feldman, whom I've already mentioned uh, here tonight, was back in Washington. And I called him with a bit of research re request because I knew that before we got to Houston, maybe the night before, 
JFK was going to speak in San Antonio at the Alamo. So I had an idea. I said, Mike, how many Catholics were on the American side, were among the American dead at the Alamo? I can make a dramatic line out of that. And he called back hours later. It must have been 2 a.m. for me, so it was 5 a.m. for him. And he said, uh, sorry, uh, uh, we've got some names, but, uh, and I've listed the names, uh, well, Carrie was one of them, and there was a Hispanic name, and maybe a couple of other Irish sounding names. He said, that, you know, we no, that nobody listed their religion in those days. Aha, I said, that's it. And that's the line in the speech. So and so, so and so, and so and so died at the Alamo, but we do not know their religion was not important because we don't know their religion because there was no religious test at the Alamo. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland.